And now our next speaker, uh, Susan Leopold with United Plant Savers, a very interesting organization uh, working on medicinal plant conservation. So please uh, welcome Susan Leopold. I'm very excited to be here today. I'm also um, extremely honored to represent United Plant Savers. And what I really hope you walk away with from my talk is how I'm going to connect how conservation is the link between enhancing health and enhancing livelihoods. United Plant Savers is a nonprofit organization. It was founded 20 some years ago, and Ed Smith, co founder of Herb Farm, would get up on his soap stand at these herb conferences in the um, 70s and 80s, and he would say, Plants don't come from a UPS truck. <laughs> and that's sort of the play on how United Plant Savers got its name. And I, as an organic farmer, um, I had a, a CSA for a number of years. I really believe that um, our understanding of where our medicinal plants comes from is where we were 10 years ago it, when we didn't really understand what the implications of where our food was coming from. Understanding the source of medicinal plants and what these plants have to teach us is the next step in human consciousness for healing the planet. Um, as we all know, uh, it was mentioned earlier that um, we've been using medicinal plants as our primary health care for um, thousands of years, and we kind of fell out of being connected to those medicinal plants. Um, but there is a revival of medicinal plants happening right now. Um, but the problem with this revival in medicinal plants and interest in medicinal plants is that people are way more hyper-focused on what these plants can do for them and not focused enough on protecting these plants in the wild and where these plants are coming from and the conservation of these plants. I'll just give black cohosh as an example. Um, it was number six in 2015 on the top list of herbal supplement sales. In 2015 alone, $43 million in sales and uh, very little, just 0, 0.00 went towards the conservation of this plant that comes from the wild. Um, and I really want to acknowledge Jim's research, um, who's a, a past board member of United Plant Savers, really looking at um, what does sustainable harvesting mean when we're talking about these wild plants. Over harvesting in North America, this is um, not just an issue of North America, it's a global issue. And um, as the herb industry grows, 12 consecutive years of growth, um, it's a nearly a $7 billion industry. That's what was spent in 2015 in herbal supplements. And of the top 65 you know, native North American herbs, only four to five of them are even seriously cultivated. So many plants like golden seal, black cohosh, um, false unicorn, uh, slippery elm have been um, over harvested. And these, these wild populations are declining. This was why uh, Rosemary Gladstar um, founded United Plant Savers. She's really the vision behind this organization. Um, she was deeply concerned um, with where these wild plants were coming from. She's also um, the founder of the International Herb Symposium. This International Herb Symposium happens every other year. And it was at this herb symposium 25 years ago that she brought together um, people who shared her concern, those who were harvesters, growers, um, herbal entrepreneurs, and they got together and they founded United Plant Savers. And this was their concern, right? I mean, this is basic. It's not complicated. Wild herb supply is going down. The demand for medicinal herbs is going up. So what makes medicinal plant conservation unique to plant conservation in general? We know, right, we're in an extinction crisis right now. Um, and that's due to the land use changes that have been happening just in the last few decades. Habitat loss, invasive species, overbrowsing, ecosystems out of balance, climate change, fragmentation, land use practices like mountaintop removal. Um, and all of this, it, where we, all of this is really affecting the health of the ecosystem. Um, Trees are facing unprecedented um, die-off due to infestation and diseases. This is happening everywhere. I don't have to give examples. I think um, many of you know the um, seriousness of what's happening to our trees. 
So you have all these things that are affecting plant conservation, and then you have the additional pressure that these plants are um, being harvested due to pressures of trade. And then on top of all that, I want to you know, really um, stress that plant conservation is really underfunded, both at the state and federal level, that most of the plant conservation rankings for these plants are decades out of date, and that the demand and trade can change with just a single market driver, right? We saw this with um, Taxol when it was recently discovered and how rapidly it was being harvested out of the forest of the Northwest, which affected um, habitat for the spotted owl. So this is my big take home message, right? The United Plants, I mean, um, the United States, in my opinion, it's an F. It fails at plant conservation. Um, and why, why is that? We don't value it and uh, sadly, we know it's a national trend that botany departments um, are closing in universities um, across the country, that they're liquidating their herbarium specimens, not important, you know, that this is what's happened. And I really want to um, highlight the fact that it was not that long ago that um, botany got its roots in the study of medicinal plants, that um, we know what we know about botany because we were looking at medicinal plants. And if you were a botanist in society, you were a very esteemed person. Um, Thomas Jefferson, a lot of our founding fathers. I mean, uh, I just want to um, highlight uh, the legacy of botany in the United States, especially in the Appalachian region. Peter Kalm, Mark Catesby, Bartram, Barton, Asa Gray, Raffinesque. Um, there are so many incredible botanists that came here, studied our biodiversity, and they all said the same thing, that the Appalachian region in particular is a biodiversity hotspot for medicinal plants. They were studying plants around the world. They were sending all these specimens back to Linnaeus, and he was putting together um, our global perspective of um, plant communities and families around the world. And the number of medicinal plants found right here in Appalachia is extremely unique, but yet we place no value in our educational system studying these plants and being um, conservationists. We have a legacy um, to honor, not just for those past botanists, but also for future generations. The United States is the only country that has yet to ratify the Global Convention of Bi on Biological Diversity. Why is that? I mean, uh, anyways, I, I, I also just want to highlight the fact that um, the recent report by the World Conservation U Union, 29% of our native plants are facing um, a risk of extinction. The United States um, has uh, unequal implementation of laws when it comes to species conservation, when you compare the plants and animals, and that um, understaffing in federal resources and land management agencies, and unequal protection at the state and federal level. This is just a, a really simple graph. This is spending in millions of dollars and across um, timeline. Plants compromise more than 50% of all listed taxa, yet less than 12% of federal funding went to any sort of recovery efforts. So even, even as we, you know, sort of su support um, endangered species for animals, plants just flatline. And when it comes to two of our most important medicinal plant species that are both listed on CITES, uh, golden seal and ginseng, they're not even listed on the IUCN red list. Why? Because we don't have um, the data. We don't have the interest, and we don't have the research funds to do this important work. And probably a, a real, I'm very passionate about this um, incredible sacred medicinal tree, and that's sandalwood. Uh, sandalwood, uh, six endemic species found in Hawaii. It is currently um, Santalum paniculatum on the Big Island, is being harvested to extinction. United Plant Savers pulled together um, all the countries that um, have sandalwood. We held a sandalwood symposium. And it became very obvious that the United States is the only country in the world where sandalwood grows, that there's no legislation monitoring its um, conservation, harvesting, or trade. Nothing. So we're just harvesting a species um, 
uh, with no regulations whatsoever, and we're the only country in the world that could care less. Um, so uh, how can um, United Plant Savers, a small membership nonprofit, achieve its mission? Um, when Rosemary brought all those people together for the International Herb Symposium and they founded United Plant Savers, she had all the stakeholders, you know, all her friends that cared about these plants, um, and they came together and they put together um, an at-risk list and a to-watch list. And it's really important to um, read the statement of purpose behind this list because um, the intent is to ensure the increasing abundance of medicinal plants, which are presently in decline due to expanding popularity, shrinking habitat and range. UPS is not asking for a moratorium on the use of these plants. Rather, we are initiating programs designed to conserve and cultivate these important medicinal plants. So this is not hands off. This is about how we can work together. This is our list. It's on our website. This is not a big list. Um, and this is our, um, our to watch list. Not long after the list was founded, uh, Kelly Kitcher, board, past board member of United Plant Savers, and his student at the time, Lisa Castle, um, worked to develop an, an assessment tool so we could more clearly communicate what makes a plant at risk. Sandalwood would be the first um, plant that we would apply this tool to, to then put it on our at-risk list, and ramps would be the second plant that we recently added to our list. The tool is really basic, and it's meant, it's all on our website, you can go in, you can check it out and read about it, but um, the tool is meant to be user-friendly by anybody, not just academics, not just botanists. And it's really simple, it looks at five, it's a series of questions that look at five key categories, and then each category um, you end up with a, with a score. The first one is the life history, what's the basic biology of the plant, um, how does it grow, how does it reproduce? The second asks questions, what is the effect of harvest? What part of the plant are you harvesting and how does that affect its ability to regenerate? And the third is the abundance and range. What is the abundance and range of that species? Fourth is what are the threats to um, its habitat? What are its vulnerabilities? And the fifth is demand. I want to go back to sandalwood because it's such a dramatic case study. Sandalwood is a hemiparasitic plant, meaning that it needs other plants, host plants, to therefore thrive. And um, mostly those are the plants that are in the Fabiaceae family. This is what sandalwood paniculatum, Centulum paniculatum, looked like on the Big Island in the 1800s before Captain Cook landed on the island and the sandalwood trade kind of kicked off. And then you had the introduction of the ungulates, right? The pigs and the sheep and the goats. And then there was poor land use decisions. And this is how much sandalwood is left now. Um, Big island, small planet. <laughs> um, I was just at the uh, IUCN World Conservation Congress. Over 10,000 people from around the world gathered. E.O. Wilson was there giving his message that we need to set aside half Earth. That's his latest book. I highly recommend it. And this came out um, on the headlines of the paper. IUCN, extinction threatens 87% of Hawaii's native plants. So if we're watching this happen on island ecosystems, on the front lines of climate change, and on the front lines of what we're doing, this is what can happen to us. Um, I can't even wrap my head around what it means to, um, to lose 87% of biodiversity. Uh, this is kind of a, a matrix, it's a graph. It illustrates um, the scoring of the plants on our at-risk list and to-watch list. So on the far spectrum is the sandalwood, and we scored plants that are not at risk on the other spectrum, such as um, yarrow, nettles, elderberry. So you can kind of see, it becomes really obvious um, how these five categories affect plants at risk. This is a picture of what Hawaiian sandalwood looks like on the Big Island and it's dying. And it's not, the threat is not that it's gonna be cut down to make sandalwood oil. It's an ecosystem that is dying. Um, so when you buy Hawaiian sandalwood and you're using that essential oil, that's the medicine you're getting is a dying, um, extinct 
sacred tree. So um, the tool is not perfect. You know, it's, it's just really there to be a quick way to evaluate um, plants and understand what makes them at risk. Now that we have this, I really want to talk about um, how the tool can be used for outreach and awareness, but then what are the solutions? And I'm going to talk about two solutions um, today, and the first one is um, one that anybody can be a part of. We don't need the government to help us do this. This is about creating botanical sanctuaries. Um, this is uh, really an old idea that we're bringing back into the modern context. It, when you study indigenous cultures around the world, you see that sacred, the idea of sacred groves is, is a unifying thing that um, uh, they've been doing for thousands of years. Here's an uh, aerial photograph of um, the, an Ethiopian church forest. So there's over 1,400 um, church forests were inventoried in 2013. So this is a cultural context where they, as a community, have set aside these areas around their religious churches that protect the trees and also protect the areas where these medicinal plants grow. Uh, here's another example, sacred groves in India. Over 13,000 documented sacred groves in India. Not only are they important um, culturally and spiritually, but they're also critical to the ecosystem and they're home to medicinal plants. Um, I lived in Costa Rica with an awa, a shaman in the Talamanca Mountains, and I would wake up every morning and we would walk his little mountain and everybody in the community knew that they were not to take any trees or any plants from that area that he managed. And we would walk, we would circle this little mountain, and we would tend those plants that he used in his medicinal practice. He knew where they were, he encouraged their growth, and he tended a sacred grove within his community. And that was a cultural context that everybody understood and appreciated. And this is also found in Appalachia. United Plant Savers purchased the Golden Seal Botanical Sanctuary not long after it was founded, and there were these historic woods, the Payne Woods, where there is what we believe the largest um, wild population of golden seal. This was historically known as a place to go and collect medicinal plants all around this area, strip mined, coal mined, deforested. But the community over time had protected this, and now we're protecting it. This year we, um, well, last year we, uh, I think wrote the first conservation easement uh, along with the state of Ohio to protect this land for the main purpose of medicinal plant conservation, education, and research. And I hope it sets a precedent for more conservation easements to be written for the protection of medicinal plants. Not long after we established the botanical, the botanical sanctuary in Rutland, Ohio, we launched this idea of a network. So we encouraged other people to start their own botanical sanctuary we have an interactive map. You can go online, read about those sanctuaries in your state. I hope after this talk, I get some people from Missouri to join our network. Um, and uh, so I want to um, really highlight the work of Tom Newmark and establishment of the Semilla Sagradas in Costa Rica and the merger of sacred seeds with United Plant Savers that we have um, est that established 33 sanctuaries in 19 different countries with a mission to build the network of sanctuaries dedicated to preservation of biodiversity. This application asks three questions, right? It asks you if you want to apply to become a sanctuary, tell us about your land. What medicinal plants grow there? What are the current conservation projects? Um, the second question looks at what are the educational programs that you're offering? And how are you going to share this knowledge with your community? And whoops, the third question is really the most important. What is your intention? Um, describe why you want to be a part of this botanical sanctuary. And this really gets to um, people's personal goals with what they want to do with their land. What are their herbal dreams? Why do they want to protect these plants for future generations? Here is um, Linda Black Elk's application in, for Standing Rock that she applied in 2005, um, establishing a botanical sanctuary. And now they're um, kind of the leading force for um, protecting water. I'm sure many of you have heard about it. Um, what we found in, in these botanical sanctuaries 
is that no story, each story is unique and that these are primarily started by women and they're doing two critical things, right? They're conserving plants and they're creating economic opportunities because knowledge is economically empowering and it promotes biodiversity. Um, another solution uh, that I want to talk about is forest farming and the role of agroforestry. And again, this is not a new idea. Indigenous land use practices have been well documented, especially with the use of fire. And I really want to highlight the work of Kat Anderson's book, Tending the Wild and her recent article in um, our journal, The Original Medicinal Plant Gatherers and Conservationists. These ideas are out there. Um, United Plant Savers is a part of a three-year grant that was awarded in 2016, the Appalachian Beginning Forest Farmers Coalition. This is a three-year program to train the next generation of future farmers. Here we are in a workshop. We, in our first year, had over 700 people enroll in the coalition. But there are some serious challenges to forest farming, and that's that it can't economically compete with harvesting of wild plant material. Um, we have to decide to do this because it's the right thing to do and because it's the middle ground between hands-off and extinction. It takes years to grow these plants, and we have to think long-term. And we have to protect the forest because we need plants that require high quality woodland habitat. And for many, we don't know quite how to cultivate them. And we need plant material for the propagation of these plants. Here's a slide that I hope you really think about. Um, these are clips from Facebook last spring. Here are some of the prices for these wild harvested plants. Trillium, fresh, 60 cents a pound. Bloodroot, a dollar. Black cohosh, two seventy-five. We're talking about decades of life selling for dollars. Um, though there are challenges, there are real benefits to forest farming, to the consumer, to the industry, and to conservation. They're the quality of the product, consistency and purity. They're the consistent sourcing that you can plan your production. And it's the timing of harvest, because many of these plants are more active in the fall when they're putting their energy back into the roots. They have more um, medicinal value then. But um, the last one, which is most important, is the conservation legacy, the future of these plants. The problem that wild harvesters are facing is the depletion of the resource, right? It's harder and harder to find these plants. The inconsistency of harvesting from place to place, how it's dried and stored, and the harvesting of the wrong plant material, not being able to properly identify what you're harvesting. Here's a picture of a um, herb farm where they have been growing cohosh under poplar trees that they planted 15 years ago because they didn't want to be buying wild harvested material and not know where it's coming from. And they wanted to be able to know what they were buying, what they were making their medicine from. So, they're growing these plants out in Oregon. We should be growing them here in Appalachia. This is a, an extremely um, important project. I want to really acknowledge the role of Mountain Rose Herbs for knowing that this is a real issue, working with United Plant Savers to achieve a solution. And this is the Forest Grown Verification Program that um, we launched just last year. I want to acknowledge the work of Eric Burkhart. He really set the groundwork for um, the infrastructure for making this program. And Mountain Rose Herbs is the first company to sell forest-grown ginseng. Um, they sell ginseng leaf, whole plant tincture, and root. And though this product is more, we're trying to set a precedent for why you should pay more money for forest-grown products. With ginseng, you have an issue that it's also um, very much a part of the illegal trade and the um, drug abuse problems that are happening in Appalachia. You can go out and harvest these plants in the wild. You can trade them for pills and heroin. And so what is the supply chain? This verifies, the forest grown program verifies the supply chain. Going back to sandalwood, I want to highlight solutions, right? TSF is uh, probably one of the largest agroforestry projects in the world. 15 years ago, they planted 5,000 acres with um, sandalwood and they had to plant it with multiple tree species because it's a hemiparasitic plant. And their vision, right, goes back to Tom Newmark. 
um, traceable supply from the soil to the oil. They're rebuilding the soil to grow the oil, right? It's a beautiful vision. This is another project, the Farm Center in Hawaii. They're restoring land through agroforestry with native trees. They've taken abandoned land that was depleted by the sugarcane industry, and they're using food forest, agroforestry pro project, project to restore the ecosystem, and they're looking at sandalwood for its edible nut. We're having this symposium next July, the future of ginseng and forest botanicals, not to be missed, where we link conservation, cultivation, and commerce. It's for growers, herbalists, apothecaries, landowners. If you want to learn about the latest research regarding these plants and how we can ensure their future, this is the conference to be at. The bottom line is that companies can reformulate. But when the plant's gone, there is no reformulation. It's thousands of years erased from ecology, right? The extinction of sandalwood, the extinction of these plants is real. Um, sandalwood native to endemic to the Juan Fernandez Islands went extinct in 1908 due to the sandalwood trade. I wrote this article about trillium, um, discussing how can we be harvesting trillium, decades of life sell it, that, is, that is selling for, what, a dollar a pound, and we have 27 different species, 18 of which of them are endangered or of concern. We need to act. Uh, we need to be willing to pay more for forest-grown products, which ensures high-quality botanicals, supports farms, saves wild populations. We need to demand transparency in sourcing. We need to educate for consumer awareness. And we need to support the expansion of botanical sanctuaries. I really want to acknowledge our sponsors. Mountain Rose, Herb Farm, and Gaia Herbs. These are leaders in the herbal industry, and other companies need to um, follow in their footsteps. And I ask consumers to be more educated and demanding. And I want you to join United Plant Savers. <laughs> I want you to support the work that we do. Absolutely, absolutely. And really, th this is the last slide. Um, it's a little corny, but the future is in our hands. You know, can we change the grade that we're getting in plant conservation? And more importantly, I really want to speak back to um, what Tom's mission is. That these, why am I here? Why do I do the work that I do? It's because these medicinal plants are talking to us. And their message is not um, how they can heal our bodies. Their message is that we need to heal the planet. And we need to pay attention to where these plants come from, what they're teaching us. And I, that's my vision. My vision is that the medicinal plant industry is going to chart the path forward to heal the planet in crisis. Thank you very much, Susan. That was a great talk. Thank you. Let's give a, a hand to our uh, speaker, Susan Leopold. I think we have time for maybe one or two questions. Um, so yes. Uh, please wait for the microphone so that the online viewers can hear the question. Is there a mechanism in place that would put the medicinal plant industry together with the landowner? I'm a landowner. Mm -hmm. I have these plants. Right. I don't know how to manage the plants, and I have no idea about the industry. Right. Well, I, I, um, I really want to highlight this new program, the Appalachian Beginning Forest Farmers Coalition. You can go on the website, you can join, and that's exactly what we're doing. We are holding um, many different events across the region, and we're trying to link herb companies to the growers themselves. And at the symposium, the Future of Forest Ginseng, we will have many herb companies represented and landowners, and we'll be doing just that. Um, you're exactly right. Um, that's... Um, so through UPS and these programs, that's, that's what we're working on. I think uh, we have, um, yes ma'am. Please wait for the microphone. So that was a great presentation, thank you. How do consumers know which products they should buy? Is there a label that would be similar to say the certified organic seal? That's a, um, a difficult question. I, that's why I really spent a lot of time talking about our at-risk tool. You know, consumers just have to think about the things um, that make plants at risk when they're making decisions, and you need to ask um, 
questions when you're buying herbal products. And I often, I also want to really highlight the fact that there's a whole movement in regional herbalism. You know, find your local herbalist, learn where, support those herb farmers in your community. It's like some of the same issues with the food movement, right? The more you can get local, the more you can know your plants, the more you can grow your own medicinal plants. You know, these, and I also highlighted the work of this forest grown program. So we really hope that um, ginseng is kind of a, the, a poster child for the forest grown program. We hope to develop this program for other medicinal plants as well. And then people could see, oh, I know this is being um, sustainably produced because it's actually being forest grown. A label would be really helpful. A label that would just say it's okay to take this product? No, the label that would assure the consumer that what they were buying right. was really what, what the product was, was being promoted for. Right. Because that's the problem with the food industry as it well. Is. Let's just take uh, perhaps one, one more question. Uh, yes, sir. Just to follow up on what this gentleman said over here. Who, uh, who in the uh, in here in Missouri at the university would we be talking to or should talk to if we have land? And I'm a total newbie at this, so um, I I would love to talk to somebody around here with what I what what I what I have and what kind of herbs and medicinal plants grow here in Missouri. We're hearing about Appalachian, but we're not hearing too much about what's actually here in Missouri. I'm sure there's an awful lot of people in this room that already know that, but. Well, I think you could, you could contact us at the Center for Agroforestry, and we'll try to help you steer to, you to uh, appropriate resources here in Missouri and surrounding states. 